This is Pennsylvania Stands Up. Okay, Hannah, we're on. Let's talk about Pennsylvania. The first thing that I'm gonna ask you is if you could tell us a little about your personal journey. Peggy. Absolutely. Um, but before I do so, I just want to extend a true uh, heartfelt thanks um, to everyone who's a part of the airlift community. Um, I don't know if if uh, Danny uh, and the team um, share with you the real um, connection um, uh, that they have with groups like mine. Um, I met uh, Danny uh, in person in Philadelphia in the summer of 2019, um, when you all had already been investing in our work and um, have been in regular contact with uh, with the whole with the whole team with Ruth and uh, Renee and Larry and Jim um, on a regular basis, um, which is a very I, I have to say exceptional relationship with a with a funder um, to have that. Uh, feedback loop to be able to engage with our strategy and um, share some of our thinking and challenges on a on a day to day basis um, throughout the organizing cycle um, has been really exceptional and has really meant a lot to our organization um, in ways that I hope I can illuminate um, in the conversation this evening. So, I just had to start with a with a note of thanks. Um, so the, the um, introduction that I'd like to give about myself um, is in some ways actually the, the story of our country. Um, my, uh, my ancestors and my father's family came to America from England in 1632, and uh, they uh, were given land by King Charles, um, which extended from the eastern shore of Virginia almost up to Pennsylvania. Um, that was land um, that belonged uh, to many different uh, native tribes, um, specifically the, um, they settled eventually um, on the land of the Anancock. And um, they held people captive, um, enslaved people there um, from, from the 1630s on um, uh, through, the, through the Civil War. Um, and then um, continued um, to have uh, economic control um, uh, uh, over the lives of the um, formerly enslaved peoples um, uh, from the Civil War through to um, the Civil Rights Movement. Um, my great-great-grandfather owned the general store and used debt to control, um, to control people's fortunes. Um, my uh, great-grandfather uh, set up a bank and continued that tradition. Um, and my cousin um, presently is a judge on the Eastern Shore, um, extending criminal control um, over the lives of the, uh, the people who live there. Um, so I come to this work out of a, a deep sense of uh, justice and reparations and my role as a white American um, in bringing America to, um, to live up to a promise that it's never delivered on. Um, I moved to Pennsylvania in, in 2016. I'd been living with my family uh, in the United Kingdom in London. Uh, we moved right in between the poles of uh, Brexit and Trump's election. And um, immediately after Trump's election, really saw something special happening in Pennsylvania, which was that there was a, a really a mass mobilization of um, everyday people, uh, many of whom hadn't been involved in politics um, prior to Trump's election, uh, who were seeking a political home, were seeking community with each other, um, certainly in Philadelphia, and Sergio will tell us a little bit about that later on in the conversation, um, but also in places in rural Pennsylvania um, uh, where there was very little political infrastructure. And um, that energy evolved uh, into Pennsylvania Stands Up um, in 2019. So uh, 2020 was actually really our first full year of a uh, of operations as a, a statewide organization. So I feel, uh, again, a really a special kinship with Airlift um, for having been with us um, uh, as we you know, embark on this um, long-term journey to redefine uh, what politics means to us and uh, whose stories are, are centered and told um, as, we build, as we build political community with each other here in Pennsylvania. 
Wow. Uh, uh, talk to us about what you're building, Hannah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Pennsylvania State's uh, Pennsylvania Stands Up is a um, multiracial uh, statewide organization um, that builds political power, um, multiracial political power um, with everyday working class people, um, most of whom, uh, uh, as I said, have um, taken a look at uh, how politics is done as usual and um, said, you know, this is not this is not for me. Um, we uh, really engage with people uh, who have uh, been disconnected, um, ignored, uh, disrespected by the political process, and we do that um, quite specifically with um, by making choices about where we where we organize in the state. Um, we focus on places that have been um, left behind um, uh, economically. Um, but also left behind politically, which, uh, truth be told, in Pennsylvania is actually most of the state. Um, you know, for those of you that don't know the Pennsylvania geography well, um, imagine like a really big rectangle. We have uh, 67 counties, and in the east is Philadelphia, our, our big city, and in the west is Pittsburgh, which is a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, but still a big city. And then in the middle, there's... Um, there's a, a lot of, uh, of, of rural communities, um, small cities and towns. And for many decades, there's really been a, um, a disinvestment by um, the Democratic Party um, and by the um, progressive um, organizing infrastructure in those places. So when all of that energy happened after Trump, um, people didn't really have anywhere to go. Um, and they eventually found each other, um, but they were fighting an uphill battle in many in many places because um, the reality is that politicians, both Republicans and Democrats, in many ways benefit from the system as it is, um, and that can be hard to wrap your brain around sometimes. Why would a uh, why would a politician not want people to vote? But it turns out that that's actually a very strategic choice to keep to keep them in power. Um, and what we, you know, what we find, I've heard stories um, from, you know, women who, moms who would put a little pin in their lapel so they would know when they went to the grocery store that it was safe to talk about politics um, with each other. Um, I heard stories from, um, from uh, farmers uh, who were um, uh, reaching out to other farmers to have political conversations for the first time. It was really um, you know, 2016 opened something up in Pennsylvania that hadn't been um, politically possible for really a long time. Um, what I think is interesting, though, is that there's actually a very rich tradition of organizing in Pennsylvania. Um, we have the still the remnants of very strong um, labor organizing um, and very strong um, even socialist traditions in our in our in our memory. Um, and uh, we we call we call on that we call on some of our movement heroes um, from Pennsylvania um, to create uh, our political organization, um, which is structured um, in the form of eight chapters. Um, you'll hear later from Sergio, um, who's an organizer with uh, Reclaim Philadelphia, um, our largest chapter. Um, each chapter um, is run. Um, uh, is directed, its political leadership and strategy is set by a leadership team of seven to nine people um, who are deeply rooted in the community um, and who represent the, represent the community, who set the political strategy, which again is really oriented um, towards uh, turning non-voters into voters and to connecting um, people back into our, into our political community. Um, and I keep saying the word community because I think that's really what we're about. We're um, certainly about winning elections, and we'll get a chance to talk about how we did that in 2020. Um, but we're also about a really a transformation about how we relate to each other um, and making sure that all of our all of our needs are met. So we very strategically choose the issues that we organize around to reflect um, people's day to day lives and lived experiences. Um, and I think most critically, we organize 365 days a year. Um, uh, Sergio uh, was just leading a call um, for uh, for reclaim organizing in neighborhoods in Philadelphia. 
There are similar meetings happening tonight all over the state that our organizers are, are leading um, on February 9th. 2021, an off year politically, um, but not at all an off year in terms of our strategy, uh, which is, you know, fixed far into the future. Um, and we know that in order to win 10 years from now, uh, we need to be very purposeful in how we engage, uh, even in off years, um, uh, or maybe even especially in off years, so that we have those solid relationships and have built another, enough political power so that we can um, demand the world that we know we deserve. Can you tell us about one or two key strategies that you're executing against now? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, I think one of the most um, transformative uh, strategies that we used in um, in 2020 and 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 before um, is deep canvassing. And in some ways, I feel like that's a like. Um, a new word for an old technique. Um, the way that I explain deep canvassing for those of you who aren't familiar to, uh, with it is um, using non-judgmental listening and storytelling um, to connect across difference. And um, in 2019, um, we ran a deep canvassing program in, in rural Pennsylvania, um, speaking to voters about their attitudes towards immigrants, um, which was very powerful because what we found was that the largely white voters that we were talking to often would say off the cuff quite offensive anti-immigrant things, um, parroting, you know, talking points that they got from Fox News or from their, uh, you know, had maybe heard in their community and for for our canvas team which was multiracial some of whom immigrants themselves um, or with close immigrant stories within their family that was you know obviously painful deeply painful to hear um and we provided a lot of um support uh to to our canvas team to be able to stay in those conversations and to probe for what's under what lies underneath that um, and what we found is it's often pain and trauma. I mean, it's pain of lost economic opportunity. It's pain of incredible stories of, of um, experiences with with health with a lack of health care. Um, it's uh, it's stories about their children, about about relatives, and the non judgmental component allowed us to get to that place, which was more true and deeper felt than the anti-immigrant sentiment. So we could actually move people on their, their racism um, and get to the, to the heart of the matter, which actually often is that people are suffering. Um, so, uh, you know, what we found in 2020 when we applied this during, in our electoral work, um, we used this in the, in the program that you all supported. Um, we had 40, over 46,000 conversations with voters using this technique, um, specifically focused on moving people to support Biden um, for president. And um, when we got at the underlying pain, we were able to move those voters to support, to firmly support uh, Joe Biden um, because uh, he and the Democrats in general have policies that get at addressing and alleviating that. So I think we, you know, we watched in Pennsylvania Trump come for rally after rally and really inflame using white supremacy and racism very tactically because it's at the surface. But deeper is this is this real um, is is real pain and um, the the um, what the Democratic Party has to offer um, can address that more fully. And so deep canvassing was. Um, an incredibly important component of our of our uh, program and um, our our orientation uh, towards this work. Well, you talked about it a little bit, but how how do you measure success in uh, in broader terms? How do how do you know yeah. what you're doing is is really working? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I think in order to answer that, um, I'd like to just um, say a few words about what we see as our path um, to long-term change. And there are um, three, three big components of that. Um, the first is um, building really a really strong social movement um, that can apply pressure from the outside. Um, and that's 
a really important lesson from history. If we look at the period after the Civil War, the Reconstruction period, if we look at the 1930s um, and the New Deal, or if we look at the um, uh, the Civil Rights Movement um, uh, in the 60s, the elected leaders during those periods made progress, Lincoln made progress because there was a strong abolition movement. Uh, Roosevelt made progress because there were strong unions and there was a strong social movement to push him. Um, same for LBJ. So we see in this moment, um, we're so proud that we did the work to elect Joe Biden, but we really strongly believe um, that we will be successful when we can push him and his administration to make good on their on their promises. Um, so the first thing that we're doing is really building strong social movements for the long term. Um, the second piece of our strategy is about electing um, progressive champions who are bold um, and relentless um, in their support for working people. And we think that's a really important um, flag in the sand um, to push the Democratic Party, which can sometimes waffle towards more centrist candidates um, to, uh, to, we make sure that we um, have a long-term strategy for electing movement candidates, um, for identifying them, for building their skills. Um, and I hope Sergio will share a little bit about some of the victories that we had um, in that regard in, um, in Pennsylvania in 2020. Um, and the third piece of our strategy that was very relevant in this past election um, is that when we don't have a progressive choice to fight for, um, we will still work to defeat um, dangerous and authoritarian candidates. So we were extremely focused on electing uh, Joe Biden, uh, although he may not have been as progressive as he could have been on, on um, a number of issues. Um, we were very united in our, in, our, um, in our focus on him. So how did we do? Um, uh, in terms of um, working to defeat dangerous authoritarians, uh, we defeated Trump. We all did. You did it <laughs> um, with us. Uh, we did it with amazing partners here in Pennsylvania. Um, Trump uh, had won in Pennsylvania in, uh, in 2016, and we uh, firmly pulled, uh, pulled Pennsylvania back and feel um, really proud of the work that um, the, the discipline and incredible hard work um, that we and our and our and many other movement partners put in um, to do so. Um, on the uh, on the front of electing progressive champions, um, we uh, were not as successful. I think many um, many states have this challenge. We were hoping um, to retake the Pennsylvania State Legislature, um, which is currently controlled by very, very conservative Tea Party Republicans. Uh, we did not achieve that objective, um, and I would be happy to share my thoughts on why that happened. Um, however, uh, we did uh, advance a number of progressive champions to the State Legislature, uh, State Senator Nikhil Saval, uh, State Representative Rick Krajewski, um, uh, State Representative Je Jessica Benham joined uh, several others. So we've gone from having a, a very small cohort of progressive legislators in Harrisburg to now a block that's working together to really put forward a uh, progressive agenda and to be the left wing of the Democratic Party. And that's a very new dynamic for us. Um, in Pennsylvania, the Democratic Party um, uh, ha contains uh, a large number of legislators uh, who would be indistinguishable from Republicans if you took away their party affiliation, people that are uh, pro-charter school, uh, pro-gun, anti-choice, um, pro-fracking. I mean, it's, uh, it, you, you wonder what the, um, what the Democratic Party stands for. There are, of course, others who are champions, but, um, but to have this cohort of, of progressive legislators is something that we're very keen to grow um, over the next 10 years. Um, and then finally, on the on the path around uh, building a, a strong social movement, um, I'm I'm so proud of what we've accomplished. Um, working with our working with our partners and seeking alignment in states um, has been notoriously difficult in Pennsylvania, and we haven't always done a good job of it. Um, but this election, there was a very clear moral call and a, and a clarity. Um, that I'm seeing continue now. I mean, it certainly continued in the post-election period, um, which I would love to chat about more, Danny. Um, 
Um, but it's continuing now with work fighting for a COVID relief bill that is going to really meet the needs of our communities who are who are really struggling. Um, and I think it will continue for the next two years while we um, have the trifecta at the national level. Thanks, Hannah. There's something I really want to get to, which is that um, we all learned a new term this year, which was uh, election defense. And mm. I, I really like it if you could uh, tell us about the role that PA Stands Up played in the days after the election. Yeah. Yeah, to tell that story, we actually have to go back to um, to the summer before the election um, when, uh, you know, Trump <laughs> showed, told us what he was going to do. He made his strategy very clear. You know, he couldn't, couldn't, he couldn't take his fingers off the Twitter button. Um, and it became very clear that it, um, in order to protect our democracy, uh, we were going to um, have to be prepared not only to uh, win electorally, um, but also to mount, mount a defense to make sure that our every vote was counted and that every vote mattered. And so uh, we began um, in Sept August, September um, to meet with our partners in state. Um, uh, we were the uh, in-state convener of the Fight Back Table, which was a statewide coalition of about 80 different organizations, some of whom were C3, some of whom were C4 doing electoral work, um, who came together to organize a clear plan for what needed to happen beginning the evening of November, well, actually beginning um, before the election to draw the line in the sand of what it, me it means to believe in our democracy um, and then to take action immediately after the election. Um, and I think uh, what we saw in Pennsylvania was, you know, Trump started uh, a campaign immediately as soon as the polls closed, um, throwing, you know, lawsuit after lawsuit um, at the courts and um, seeking through a variety of tactics to um, make his, his narrative stick in the media. And our counter to that was, um, uh, joyous resistance in Philadelphia, in Harrisburg, in Allentown, in Lancaster, in Pittsburgh, in Westmoreland, in Erie, um, from that Tuesday evening through the Saturday where Biden was declared victor, uh, we held as a state 46 different um, celebrations of democracy um, in Philadelphia. And I'd love to hear Sergio tell the story because he was on the ground. Um, there was a dance party that went on uh, for days. Um, uh, put together by uh, an amazing coalition of um, labor, faith, um, and com community organizations to um, to really lift up um, what is so beautiful about our democracy, to lift up the multiracial coalition of working people that had delivered the election for Biden. Um, and, you know, when Trump lawyers tried to come to town, um, you know, there were people dancing in the streets, there were DJs, there was a bedazzled eagle, there were balloons, there were snacks, um, and they were simply drowned out um, and, you know, had to retreat to uh, Four Seasons landscaping in the northeastern part of the city. Um, so it was, it was very effective to take control of the narrative in that way and not let his story about what had happened um, get, take hold. Um, and uh, it was beautiful for our movement to be very disciplined with our message. I mean, really, we're centering the, um, the leadership of this multiracial coalition, centering the leadership of Black and Brown Voices. Um, we had beautiful visuals with engaged artists and um, DJs and drummers and dancers. Um, we had um, uh, food from various countries. Uh, it, was, it was really joyful, um, which was, you know, I think, you know, for those of us who were involved in the electoral work and for those of you who have done this kind of work of knocking doors and talking to voters, usually after the election, you're like really tired. <laughs> Uh, we were tired, I'm not going to lie, um, but it was also truly an expression of joy and community and something that um, I think I will always, always remember um, uh, that, that real celebration and how effective that was as a resistance tactic. 
Uh, Hannah, let, let's include um, Sergio in the discussion now because I, I want people to understand how brilliant um, that strategy was uh, because my understanding is that the uh, militias were, uh, that was the point at which they were looking for conflict. So Sergio, yeah. do you wanna? Yeah, yeah, uh, just to give you, my, my name is Sergio. I use I'll he, him pronouns. I'm with Reclaim Philadelphia, which is a chapter of PA Stands Up. Um, the election defense was something that was really important. Uh, and we knew, we basically formed like what was called an action council of several community organizations, labor, faith, a lot of folks that honestly wouldn't traditionally be working with each other. But in this uh, moment of anxiety, uh, we all understood that we had to work together. And as Hannah mentioned, we didn't always, the block party was something that kind of like came up. Uh, we, we did, we were scared that we were going to have these two groups that were going to be very, you know, aggressive and, and um, we were worried about how the media would paint the left in one of those situations. We were also worried about like actual harm happening to a lot of our members who are turning out to these events in 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 de defiance and like to, to celebrate democracy and make sure that every vote was going to be counted because the people that were taking to the streets in Philadelphia were trying to stop the count here because that was the way that they were going to make sure that they, you know, made sure that Biden wouldn't win the state. Um, but there was a lot of organizers that got together and said, like, how do we change the narrative? And so what we decided to do was turn that uh, moment, which could have been like really violent, into a space of radical joy. Um, that's where you, you saw all of the music and the dancing and the viral moments. Um, and with that, another reason that we wanted to do that is that we thought that if there would be a fight of two opposing sides, that a lot of the media would focus on, let's hear both sides of this situation of like, why this is this. With us taking to the streets in radical joy and kind of like already assuring that we had won, that the people had spoken, that changed a lot of the, the media narratives about what was happening on the streets. So it instantly was talking about, it wasn't like, here are two equal sides that feel differently about this. It was like, here is one side that is like radical and beautiful and joyous. And this is the sad little group that wants to make sure that your vote isn't counted. Um, so I was, it was beautiful to be a part of that. It was also beautiful because the people, the electeds that showed up on the street were movement candidates. Like this would, should have been a movement where like a moment where every Democrat elected in the city was on the streets and talking about what was at stake for us in that moment. But it was really the people that were from the movements in the grassroots who understood what was really, uh, what was really like could happen there. So they were the ones that were on the streets whether it was council members, Helen Gim, it was Rick Krajewski, uh, State Representative Rick Krajewski uh, and Nikhil Saval and those kind of folks who were out there with organizers holding the line to make sure that um, a democracy was going to be respected in our city. I think you, you just answered my second question, which was, what do you find exciting about this work? Um, could you talk a little bit about how you became an organizer? Yeah, yeah, I definitely, I mean, I think that the exciting thing is like how I got involved because like just to let y'all know a little bit about myself, um, I was born in Washington DC to uh, Chilean immigrants, um, and I've and I've kind of and I've kind of I've kind of always DC or, or my, um, my mom had a house outside of DC in Maryland, Montgomery County, which is another progressive blue bubble in Maryland, and then I lived a few uh, years in Brooklyn, but. I was very apathetic because uh, the candidates that I always supported in the primaries would never make it uh, past the primary. Uh, so it, for me, it was very hard. You know, like I was supporting folks like Bernie Sanders, um, and I never see saw after the primary that the views that the values that I supported were, were supported by the party at large. Um, something interesting happened after the election of Donald Trump. You know, I was terrified. Um, as a son of Chilean immigrants, like I have a deep connection to the dictatorship that happened uh, in Chile. I, I had an uncle who was disappeared. Um, I had an aunt and cousins who had to flee to Italy as refugees during that moment. So when I saw Donald Trump 
on the campaign trail, I understood um, what a, a strong man personality type, how it could enamor some folks. Because I'll tell you, I'm, I know deeply my history and my family's history, and many of my family still support the dictatorship. Uh, and still hold views that like support a lot of the the you know the violence that 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 we know of that moment in time. So what that said to me is that even in even the people that you really care about, who are good, decent people, are the some of the same people that are going to stand by while atrocities are being done. So that's what really scared me about the election of Donald Trump. I saw what he was saying in the campaign. Uh, I, I'm, I'm one of the people is, uh, that if somebody tells you who they are, I like trust them. <laughs> and I like, I know that that's what you're actually going to be. So like I, Tr Trump was constantly telling us what he was going to do. Now, that was, this, uh, that was a moment that really agitated me and wanted me to get more involved. But like I said, I was very apathetic. The thing that changed is in Philadelphia, um, directly after uh, the election, there was a race for district attorney. Um, and we helped elect the most progressive DA in the in the country, which was Larry Krasner. Um, he ran against a whole field of Democratic opponent, opponents who were supported by the establishment and the, the Philly police unions here. Um, and he took them all on and he won. And that was because of the organizing and because people really knew that they wanted somebody in line with their values to be in, in, in the DA's office. So the way that I came into being involved is that I saw some of these things happening. Like I always cared about politics and I would watch it, but I was never really involved. I was more of a slacktivist, like somebody just yelling into the internet void about my opinions. Um, but seeing organizers walking around with reclaimed shirts as they're canvassing for Larry Krasner and then seeing Larry Krasner actually win against all odds gave me the hope uh, that, that my values could actually work and win if we're all organized together. Um, so that's how I got involved with Reclaim is um, I had been following them and, and, and it was like, uh, we have these races called committee people, which are like political uh, block captains for the city. And uh, they go on to uh, form these wards in the city that uh, endorse specific candidates in the primary. So what Reclaim started to do was start to focus on these super hyper local races um, because Reclaim was, you know, there were a lot of former Bernie volunteers and what they learned is they didn't have enough power um, to affect things at the national level. So what would it look like if we took a bottom up approach to organizing uh, and building power. And that's what we've been doing in the city. So it started with folks like Larry Krasner. It continued with people like me running for committee person and helping democratize um, wards throughout the city. Um, Nikhil Saval, who, run, who won for state senator, he started by running for committee person, becoming the first AAPI Democratic ward leader in the city. Uh, and that kind of pushed him into the trajectory. Um, so I, I, I uh, one of the leaders reached out to me about running for committee person. I, I like many people, there were a lot of things that I said to myself about why I didn't deserve to build power, why I as a, a Latino in West Philadelphia didn't deserve it, why as a queer person I didn't deserve it, why as a high school dropout I don't deserve to be building power. But that was all in my head. And what canvassing and door knocking helped me understand is that people really just care about the issues. If you talk about the issues um, and what, what's impacting them and their community, honestly, like if, if you leave out the party affiliation and ideology, most of the time we're going to agree on many of the same values. Um, so running for committee person like was a liberating experience for me. It helped me step into power. Um, but it also kept me on this trajectory. So I helped uh, after running for committee person, which was in the primary of the gubernatorial, um, I was a field organizer for, for, the Rio, for Tom Wolf for governor. And it was one of those things where at the time I wasn't super excited about it because he's not somebody that is super aligned with me. But now going through all of that election defense, I am so thankful for the groundwork that we did in that race because how different would it look like for this election to have a Republican governor call the shots when it comes to how voting is done in our, our, in our, our state, who are going to be the electors, all those kind of things. So I'm excited. I feel like 
through the investment and, and leadership development of other organizers and Reclaim and throughout PA Stands Up, we have been building this new progressive vision for what bl brown, black and brown leadership looks like. Um, and that's what I'm excited about because for Philadelphia, it's not a problem that um, there isn't enough diversity when it comes to elected office. It's the fact that the people who are in elected office have a D next to their name, but they don't have the values that we care about. And I'm sorry, that, that's me talking a lot. I, I, I'm, you got to stop me sometimes. No, this is great. This is great. <laughs> In the process in the of process talking, of talking. answered a bunch of my questions, but um, I I want to know how do you turn slacktivists into activists? So I, I you you do it by providing the political engagement that they're sorely missing. Um, the reason that I was apathetic is not because uh, it, it wasn't because I didn't care about what was at stake at me. It wasn't because I didn't understand you know, what it was like to be a queer person, to be the son of immigrants um, in Trump's America. The reason that I, was, that I was apathetic is because I had a party that wasn't really invested in me. It wasn't invested in people with my values taking on leadership. Hannah kind of mentioned it earlier, but in Philadelphia, they're not that excited about getting you to vote because they see it as more of an attack on themselves. The Democrats already control uh, ever like who, if you're a Democrat, you win in the primary and then the general is done. So the Democratic Party here is actually scared of you actually realizing that you have more power than you understand. Um, one of the candidates I was really excited about uh, helping elect was Kendra Brooks. She was a Working Families Party candidate um, and she was running for one of the two seats on city council here that are reserved for a minority party. So there is no chance that a Democrat can get these two seats because they're reserved for a minority. And because of that, for decades, Republicans had these two seats on council that they didn't deserve. Like there is not enough Republicans that should vote for them. So we had to make the case to Democrats to say, hey, could you save some of this, the spots on your ballot that you would say for Democrat and instead vote for these two Working Families Party candidates? It won't hurt the Democrats. All the Democrats are going to win. We just also want to kick out the Republican and have somebody who really reflects our values on there. And for the first time in decades, we got we, we kicked out a Republican. We have a Working Families Party candidate who is really aligned with us and is always in. And, and I'll tell you, like, Kendra Brooks and Nicholas O'Rourke, what Working Families Party candidates, they were on the front lines of election defense. So a lot of the Democratic Party who were saying, don't trust these people, they, they want the Democrats to lose. Those were the same people that were out there on the streets, making sure that every vote was counted. Um, so I'm super excited about bringing more black and brown progressive leadership to our city. Okay, let's hold on to this energy. We've got 10 minutes uh, for uh, uh, questions that people have, uh, have put into the chat. Uh, I'm gonna uh, ask, uh, Chris Lydon has been keeping an eye on those questions. Uh, Chris, uh, what have you got? A couple things. So there are a couple people who are interested in hearing from both Hannah and Sergio with a sense of why more progress was not made at the state level. What was your perspective on that? Yeah, um, I'd love to weigh in on that and then um, hear Sergio's perspective. Um, I think there were a couple of things that happened. Um, one is that the um, Pennsylvania Republican Party, um, just like the GOP nationally, um, doesn't actually do very well on the issues. Um, the way that they know how to win is by changing the rules of the game. Um, and they have been doing that in Pennsylvania um, for many years now by attacking voting rights. And um, in uh, the fall of 2019, um, the, the uh, progressive community had been pushing for many years um, to get mail-in uh, voting in Pennsylvania. Um, but the bargain that they struck um, in order to get mail-in voting, which I realize many of you are in California where you've been happily voting by mail for a long time, that was new for us this year. The bargain that they struck in order to get mail-in voting, which was a good thing for sure, um, was we gave up straight, uh, straight ticket voting. So you no longer could push 
um, the lever for Joe Biden at the top and then, um, you know, elect, uh, you know, candidates from row offices down to down, ba down ballot candidates. Um, that went away. And we, you know, we're still understanding the impact of that. Um, um, but that was one, one structural change. Um, certainly, I think that we're still seeing the legacy of the decades-long disinvestment um, in Democratic Party infrastructure um, uh, statewide in Pennsylvania. Uh, we're seeing a, uh, dis uh, the, still seeing the impact of disinvestment in um, narrative and messaging strategies that really um, speak to everyday people. Um, unfortunately, far too many um, Democratic candidates still use more or less a vote blue no matter who, um, without understanding that, uh, you know, at the edges of the political spectrum, there are people who are, you know, diehard um, Democrat identify, just like at the, you know, at the other end of the spectrum, there are folks who are diehard Trump, Trump identified. And, um, you know, he rallied his people in Pennsylvania over and over again. But the vast majority of people fall somewhere in the middle and don't neatly fall into this or their whole, you know, their worldview doesn't align right left. It's not a core part of their identity. They might, you know, care about one issue, not care about another issue. They might be really disengaged and turned off from politics altogether. Um, and the Democratic Party um, ha has not invested in what I believe needs to be um, a very strategic approach to uh, to a very strategic narrative approach that re-engages those people um, and and brings them into uh, into political community with each other. Um, I would also say that there were some tactical errors that really cost uh, cost us, um, including unfortunately um, uh, we saw an overinvestment in television, um, a real an incredibly expensive um, a strategy. Um, um, and one that I just wouldn't spend my dollars on. Um, we need to be talking to voters uh, one, one by one um, uh, and, and connecting them um, uh, into long-term political organization. And that simply isn't the orientation um, of, the, of the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania. And I think it hurt us um, in November. Um, but we have, a, we have a plan for that. Um, we're certainly doubling down on our efforts to build power um, we are going deep in our candidate recruitment strategy. Um, the path to 2022 um, is we're, you know, two years into that plan. Um, we're very clear on, um, on the work that lies ahead for all of us, um, uh, uh, not just with retaking the Pennsylvania state legislature, which I absolutely believe is within reach, and I do believe we'll get there in 2022. Um, we also are facing an incredible uh, an incredible Senate uh, opportunity to pick up a seat for the U.S. Senate, um, which I would be happy to talk more about. But um, I think we can overcome the challenges that we face in um, in Pennsylvania. Um, and I, you know, I'm really looking forward to digging in with our with our partners um, and making those um, strategic investments beginning now uh, to do so to do much better. I also wanted to jump in and say that something that was different about this is the pandemic um, and how we responded to shifting tactics. So something that a lot of us, you know, felt uncomfortable about, but we decided because of the pandemic, we were going to do less door knocking. And I will say that on reflection after this election cycle, I, I think that we're going to have to really just commit to it because the Republicans kept door knocking and it is the most effective way uh, to make sure that your voice is getting out there. So if we're not doing that outreach door to door, um, just expect the Republicans will do that and uh, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll be swept up into whatever outreach they get. So that's something that, and also, yes, the, the, the straight ticket party, I, I noticed it as a committee person, which just goes to show why we need more committee people that are actively involved because a lot of people, they'll go into a presidential and they'll just vote for the top and never like expect to do, they don't really know much or care about the rest. So having somebody explain to you, you know, well, this is really important, like don't forget, you also have to do this, is makes a big difference. Um, and which is why we need more people at the hyper local level uh, taking on these, uh, these, these roles. So another question, and perhaps it's a headline uh, question, which is what's the worst moment during the 2020 election for you? And how did you get through it? Mm 
I got a lot. <laughs> I mean, the pandemic is really, really hard for everybody. So, and for people like me, I re I get a lot out of connecting with people and being social. So for me, it, it was very hard to organize over the last year to not be able to be in social spaces, seeing people eye to eye, like seeing like, you know, body language, all those things was very difficult. Another thing that uh, just uh, on top of facing uh, a pandemic and economic crisis, I, I live in West Philadelphia and, and, and this might have made national news, but uh, following the, the George Floyd murder, there were uprisings here um, near, near my house. Um, and I was actually tear gassed by police. I had uh, met other committee women um, who were with me, me also got tear gas shot by rubber bullets. So that was like one of the most frightening things for me is seeing the militarization of these residential neighborhoods over a mile of residential neighborhoods that were tear gassed hadn't been used since the move bombing. And for folks who don't know, um, uh, like over 30 years ago, the police department basically threw a bomb in a residential neighborhood um, and uh, killed like seven adults, children, and, and with it also burned down several resident, like rows and rows of residential uh, houses in that area. So since that time, we haven't had tear gassing in our neighborhoods and they chose to employ it in West Philadelphia on 52nd Street, which is a black, historically black owned corridor. Um, and we had, mili and we had uh, military like armored vehicles going down our neighborhood. And for me, as somebody who was just like a few months earlier in Chile, uh, which had their own uprisings in reaction to neoliberalism, it was like a youth led movement um, that started in, in protest of a fair increase and then just escalated to now we got rid of the whole constitution. <laughs> from the dictatorship, which I'm really excited about. But I was there in January of last year, and I saw armored vehicle, armored tanks coming down Santiago as I'm going to go get ice cream with my family, shooting water cannons of everywhere, well, at everybody, no matter who. And then to come back to the, my home country and in my own neighborhood, two blocks away, to have armored vehicles coming down and tear gassing everybody. That was like a very terrifying moment for a, for me in my neighborhood, and it just showed that. And this this was a, a this is a democratic city with democratic mayors. Um, uh, so this is something that that was the hardest moment for me is on top of the pandemic and crisis to also deal with police violence in our own neighborhood um, was very very difficult for me and. I'm part of the NAACP, one of a, an NAACP lawsuit to try to get greater accountability from the police when it comes to that. Uh, Chris, we have time for one more question. Are you sure of that? Yes. <laughs> um, well, several people were interested in um, a, a little bit more amplification of the, what, what do you, what's your perspective concerning this open Senate seat? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, it's getting it's getting hot here in Pennsylvania already. Um, there are uh, a number of candidates who've thrown their hat in the ring, um, and there are many more that are um, that are uh, being passed around the rumor mill. Um, you know, we are very clear that this is a uh, Senate seat that we can win. Um, uh, the outgoing uh, Republican senator has been an absolute disaster, um, uh, speaking out of one side of his mouth about being independent from Trump, but falling in line and again using um, white supremacist um, anti-immigrant messaging when it's politically convenient for him. And that's just absolutely unacceptable from any leader uh, of any party. Um, uh, so we know that we're we are already doing the um, the organizing work uh, to have the political power that we're going to need to um, to win that seat. Um, we hope that there will be a progressive champion. Um, but as I outlined, um, we are very very clear that um, de defeating uh, dangerous uh, Republicans um, who will use white supremacy to divide us is uh, is a top organizational priority as well. Um, we, uh, we run an endorsement process as a statewide organization um, from, the, from the ground up. So each of our chapters make a decision independently um, about how they will endorse. 
and then uh, they send uh, two delegates to form a delegates assembly, which makes decisions on behalf of the statewide body to um, to endorse, which we expect to do um, in uh, uh, late 2021 or early 2022. Um, and we know that the organizing work that we're doing right now um, <clears throat> uh, to fight around um, around housing, to uh, to organize around mass liberation, to fight for health care, to fight for the COVID relief bill, um, is going to bring people uh, into Pennsylvania stands up who will stand with us. Um, you know, 18 months from now, uh, when we're uh, when we're on the doors, you know, so the com the organizing conversations that we're having today. Um, there's a direct line between those and the um, political power that we're building for 2022. Um, and, uh, you know, I really look forward to being in conversation with you all about that, about that race. Um, uh, certainly, I, you know, I, I, as I said at the beginning, um, I think Airlift as a funder has been really exceptional in understanding how important um, long term um, investment is in organizing, um, you know, to build the leadership of, of leaders like Sergio, um, leaders like Nikhil Saval and Rick Kajewski that you've heard, of, uh, heard about in Philadelphia, um, but also in the rural communities where we're organizing. We need to do this work um, everywhere in Pennsylvania so that we can win these statewide races and um, to counter that, that decades-long pattern of, of disinvestment and, and treating people as if their votes can be taken for granted. Um, because we know they can't, and we know that they'll turn their backs on politics or the Democratic Party if we if we do so. So, um, I, uh, you know, your your support and um, engagement in our organization over multiple years and um, investment in early organizing um, is exactly the intervention that's needed um, for us to um, for us to be successful in 2022. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Sergio. We love what you're doing and we're looking forward to uh, staying in touch. Um, Thank you so much. One other question in the chat was um, probably more advisory, which is uh, uh, what kind of antidotes do you um, recommend relative to Trumpism? What are some actions that you've taken and what are some actions that perhaps we can deploy? I mean, I would say like similar to what Hannah said about the relational canvassing, that is like the number one way. What we're seeing in Pennsylvania is that after the insurrection, there's a lot of Republican voters who are switching parties uh, or just leaving the Republican party and being a third party. Can uh, so these are folks who like saw what happened and were disgusted. And these are people that we need to organize. Um, we need to be building the bigger we for the wins that we need for our state. Um, and a lot of that comes from the way that we use narrative, the way that we engage with voters. Um, and similar to what Hannah was saying, it's not just saying blue wave and, and vote for this color or this party. It's talking about the issues. It's talking about values and talking about how your family's impacted and what kind of community and future you want to be building. And that's the way that that's the antidote to Trumpism is the act similar to what was at the antidote to my ap apathy is having somebody actually give you meaningful political engagement yeah i would add to that um one value that's really central to our organization is that we speak about race very explicitly in all of our conversations because as i you know shared my family's story with you at the beginning of the call it's such a defining feature feature of our of our culture of our economy um and i think for far too often um we've avoided naming how how race structures our lived experience um and certainly our, our political economy um so it's, it's very very important um to name how race is used strategically to, to how to, how race is used strategically to divide us um and to name how um, you know, Pennsylvania, a state that's uh, nearly 80% white, um, that white people in in Pennsylvania and in America uh, are, have an investment investment in whiteness because the system gives us crumbs um, that keep us believing in a system that ultimately benefits those at the very top. Um, so it's we you know we have conversations uh, about about race. Um, when we organize in in white communities, I actually think those are some of the most vital and important conversations um, that we need to have. 
at a time when the GOP in Pennsylvania is openly embracing white supremacy, um, uh, you know, where the men uh, legislating in the halls in Harrisburg are standing literally on the streets with the men in furs with guns. Um, they're they're one and the same, openly and unabashedly. Um, so our our movement, I think, it needs to not shy away from um, those difficult those conversations um, and to wade right right into it because it is so central to our lived experience um, uh, as Americans in this culture. So there's one question you may you may enjoy. So if if, if you doubled your budget, how would you spend that money? Oh, Sergio, do you want to speak to that? I know that's a question <laughs> you've been playing around with for your organizing work. I mean, I, I just always want to do more leadership uh, investment and in specifically in black and brown organizers. Um, something I'm reflecting on in Philadelphia is that there are areas where we don't have bases yet um, that were like us really let there are Latino wards in Philadelphia that are usually they don't come out to vote or what we saw is that they were actually coming out to vote for Trump because there was actual investment and outreach to them. It's not because they share the same values as the Republican Party. Um, so what I would like is more investment specifically in Latino communities and AAPI communities, um, co communities that the Democratic Party honestly doesn't invest in or they just expect us to vote the way that we want to, but we know that that's not the way it works. Um, and so like, that's why I, I would love to invest in ha hiring more organizers in areas where we don't have base, building up uh, leaders, making sure that everybody is taking on, you know, running for local office and, and, and making, reshaping the Democratic Party into something that's more aligned with what we want to do. So yeah, I, I would just like, I'd want to hire all the organizers and, and make sure we're building up all of these new leaders that, that we can be excited about, that there's going to be like the new squad. I feel like as the executive director, I need to uh, <laughs> uh, expand on that. I too would invest a double, double my budget in organizing, um, but I'd also really pay attention to the infrastructure that we have to support those organizers because um, we know that um, there are going to be movement moments like what happened um, in, in, in the summer. Um, you know, Sergio was describing the incredible mobilization that was happening in Philadelphia, led by um, new organizers, young, uh, young people, black and new, uh, uh, new black and brown activists. And it wasn't just in Philadelphia, just like what I described in 2016. We saw this surge happening all over Pennsylvania, including in quite rural parts of the state. And I, my goal for Pennsylvania Stands Up is that it can be an organization that can absorb those momentum moments. We don't necessarily know what they will be in the future, but we know that they will come. And when they do, we need to be ready. So we don't have a repeat of 2016 where people are resorting to buttons in the supermarket to find someone to talk to, where there's a political <laughs> organization so that we can have the power that we need. And I, I don't, that it would be it's such a mistake um, to not build an organization that can accordion out um, to really support and invest in that in the leadership that people naturally display and have that incredible innate social intelligence um, to bring them into into organization. And so that requires investment um, in incredibly unsexy things like you know finance and human resources and operations. So I just that that plus the organizing that all that Sergio was talking about. <laughs> Great, and I you. do want to say also, like, Philadelphia, what happens in Philadelphia, we're building a lot of power, but so much of what we build is inhibited by what happens in Harrisburg because the Republicans control. So for me, it's really beneficial for our chapter to be part of this statewide structure. So I know that there are people in all of these other areas of the state who are trying to build statewide power together, because I know that on our own, we can't change Harrisburg just in Philadelphia. It's gonna take all of the cities working together uh, and, and organizers working across the state. And, and, and unfortunately for a lot of folks, they leave out parts of the city, uh, of the state. They'll say things like, oh, that's just Pennsylvania, who cares? That is the, what leads us to losing elections because when you ever you say like, well, this person is too far gone, we, we shouldn't invest there. That's how you give up. Uh, really early. So I'm really excited to be building statewide power with PA Stands Up and all the other chapters that we have. Mm -hmm. 
Well, I personally have a question, which, which is the use of chapters and whether one of the metrics of your success are to expand and add additional chapters and, and how are you going about doing that? Yes, absolutely. Um, we, we are, we're power hungry and serious about <laughs> winning and we know that we need to have um, uh, more chapters in order to do so. Um, so the way that we're approaching that um, is through leadership development. Um, in, uh, in 2020, we launched um, in the winter um, a fellowship program and recruited 75 um, leaders uh, who uh, were all across the state. Um, we actually partnered with Pennsylvania United, um, which is a sister organization that organizes more in the western part of the state. And um, these were um, uh, people that were organizing on their own grassroots um, without support. So we became that support for them to train them in organizing skills, um, to teach them how to do um, how to do one on ones, how to move someone into a leadership role, everything that Sergio was describing. Um, those people then um, took on leadership roles in our relational canvas that I described over the summer. They led volunteer teams in our um, large uh, distributed program. And a number of them have now built a base of support around them that um, will eventually become a chapter. So they've established a leadership team. They're beginning to work on campaigns. Um, some of them threw down with us when we were doing the democracy defense work. Um, so we absolutely are nurturing that kind of organic leadership and we're paying close attention um, to the, um, the political trends. I mean, we know that there are you know, small cities throughout Pennsylvania that have substantial communities of color, um, some historic African-American communities, some places where there are um, growing immigrant communities. Um, we know where there's, um, you know, where there's colleges. Uh, we pay attention to um, past voting behaviors. So, you know, in Pennsylvania, um, uh, as recently as 2008, there were um, some Democrats elected from the center of the state um, who lost in the Obama midterms. So we have our sort of eyes on places where we want to cultivate um, chapters that we think are good places. Um, um, but the truth is, you know, given infinite resources, we could organize in all 67 counties. <laughs> um, we don't do that because then we'd be dead. And <laughs> so we're strategic about it, but we definitely already have a plan in place for building uh, new new leadership and see tons of potential um, to grow the organization statewide. Great, thank you.